my name is Jakub Novosad, and together with Tom Stempiski, we uh, want to want to uh, present our work about how to describe uh, in a uh, quantitative way uh, multi-layer spatial patterns. And uh, I would start by saying that our work is uh, aimed at enabling new things and, and expanding uh, existing analysis, uh, mostly in terms of working with uh, so-called landscapes. So uh, as landscapes, we understand uh, heterogeneous parts of the, of the Earth's surface with characteristic patterns of, uh, of some themes. And those themes include uh, land cover or climate or soils or, or topography. And if we think about uh, describing and delineating, delineating of, of landscapes, we, we can create landscape types. So landscape types are larger areas of consisting of, of similar landscapes. And uh, they are useful for, for uh, management of resources and because they relate to some uh, ecological and, and social processes. However, creating those landscape types is, is challenging due to several factors. Uh, currently, we have three main approaches to create uh, landscape types. Uh, the first one is manual de delineations. So manual delineations are usually uh, of high quality, uh, but they have some, uh, uh, they, they, this approach uses a lot of data, but also uh, use a lot of uh, resources and many people are, 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 need to be involved in that, those kind of uh, delineations. Uh, another uh, approach or group of approaches is uh, probably the most popular currently uh, call, which I called cell-based approach. So in the cell-based approach, we are uh, gathering several data sets like uh, land form and land cover and several others. And we look at each cell and we uh, create an overlay of each cell. So for example, one cell is a forest on top of a mountain with, a, with a, some type of a climate. And you can see, uh, one of the possible results on the screen right now. The third approach is slightly different. It is, it is called pattern-based approach. And in this approach, uh, we tessellate the whole uh, area that we study, um, like a continent on a, or, or, or a globe data, into smaller blocks. Uh, and each block, uh, which we called local landscape, has its own pattern. And uh, because of these uh, patterns, we want to group those uh, landscapes into, into categories. And this way we can create landscape types. And you can see several landscape types here based just on the land cover patterns. However, all of those approaches have uh, limitations or constraints. So with manual approach, the biggest uh, uh, constraint probably is the uh, time uh, consuming part of this approach, uh, which also includes a lot of work, a lot of people, which can uh, influence that the, the, the result is probably inconsistent over time and over a large areas and not reproducible and also hard to update. Cell-based approach, has its own problems and own limitations. Uh, mostly when we work with cells and cell-based approach, we only think about the sky, scale of one cell. And because of that, we can only have homogeneous land, cover, land, land pattern types. By homogeneous, I mean, we can only have, uh, each cell can only have one value and the uh, overlay can only have, um, one value of each uh, layer of, of each team. And because of that, we have a very large number of possible classes as, as the output. And the third uh, approach, the main limitation of the third approach is that uh, those uh, methods, pattern-based methods currently use just one layer or just one team. Mostly it is uh, uh, land cover data. 
So my goal was to uh, expand this third approach, a pattern-based approach to represent not only single uh, team data, but multi-thematic uh, categorical patterns. So uh, maybe I should uh, expand a little bit about pattern-based spatial analysis and what we can do right now, what's, what, what, what is uh, uh, possible currently. So currently we think about pattern-based methods as having some area that you want to study, dividing that area into smaller blocks called local landscapes. And for each of those local landscapes, we can describe its pattern using spatial signatures. And next we can compare, for example, this local landscape with this based uh, on those spatial signatures using uh, dissimilarity measures. And this allows us to uh, do several types of analysis. Like, for example, I want to search landscapes the most similar to this one, or I want to group uh, landscapes that are very similar to each other into some groups. So what are, the sp what are spatial signatures? <clears throat> the most uh, uh, often used spatial signature is the uh, co-occurrence matrix which calculates not only how much of what was the proportion of each category in our data, but also uh, it, it also uh, uh, contains spatial relationship of our data. So we can uh, see uh, how often our, um, for example, agriculture borders next to forest and how often water borders next to another water and so on and so on. And you can see it here. So uh, on the diagonal, we have areas which one category borders uh, with another category is ad adjacent to another category of the same kind. But when if you look at in the rows or in the columns, you can see how often one category is adjacent to another category. Uh, and this way we can very um, uh, in a very compact way, describe not only composition, but also configuration of this spatial pattern of this one uh, data type of, one of, of, of the land cover. And next we need to do some preparations or, or simplifications. So for our calculations, we need to drop the two dimension of this matrix into just uh, one vector. So we can see a vector of 16 values we also know that the values in the upper uh, corner and, and, and lower corner are the same, so we can uh, sum them up and, and finally we, we should normalize them to sum to one. And this one last part is very important. So now I know that uh, almost 98% of my uh, pattern here is, is the forest cells adjacent to another forest cells and so on. And the last part is important because now we can do the same for every local landscape in our data that we are want to analyze. So on the left, you can see one local landscape, second local landscape on the right. Both of those local landscape, they are described using this uh, spatial uh, signature. And finally, we can use uh, some kind of a dissimilarity measure to calculate how similar or dissimilar they are. And we can see that between this raster and this raster, the dissimilarity is about 0 0.007. However, uh, if we have a very different uh, landscapes, this value will be larger. And knowing those uh, tools, we can ap uh, apply them in, in uh, several contexts that I described in the uh, paper, uh, which are uh, finding similar patterns. So we are uh, taking one local landscape and we are comparing that into a whole larger area and we can find which areas have the smaller distance, meaning they are the most similar. We can quantify changes in spatial patterns by comparing two uh, data sets from different times. And we can see that larger distance means larger change in patterns. And finally, we can cluster, uh, cluster areas with similar spatial patterns. Uh, and the, the last approach 
could is, is used exactly for uh, creating uh, landscape types, but until now it was just used for creating landscape types based on just one uh, type of a data. And here we want to uh, incorporate a, and, 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 and show you something new, which is called integrated co-occurrence matrix. So the, the previously shown co-occurrence matrix works really well when we just have one team or one layer, one raster, categorical raster data. Uh, but what to do if we want to uh, think about spatial patterns in a multi-team way? So what, how to uh, represent patterns not only of land cover, but for example, also on, on of landforms and some other categorical data. And uh, we looked for the, the solution for some time and finally found uh, some suggestions in the area of image recognition, where they proposed uh, the extension of co-occurrence matrix for rep to represent color and intensity of pixels in a regular images. However, with some slight changes, this idea could be also incorporated into categorical rasters. And that's what we have done. So we uh, readapt this idea from image recognition and uh, call that idea integrated co-occurrence matrix in comma in, in short uh, to represent multi-thematic spatial patterns uh, in a uh, quantified way. So this, this uh, representation not only uh, gives us um, information about pattern of one team and not only about pattern of the second team, but also about the relative positions of both patterns, which, which is uh, important in, in, in most studies probably. So how this uh, integrated co-occurrence matrix looks like. So you can see uh, a true example here and the uh, integrated co-occurrence matrix is basically four co-occurrence matrices. So this is a co-occurrence matrix for the land cover only. Next, we have a, a landform uh, co-occurrence matrix only. And next we have cross co-occurrence matrices. So this is, they describe the relative position of land cover versus landforms and landforms versus land cover. So this is uh, how we can think about this representation. But in, in, in total, this representation always gives us a, uh, a square matrix that again, we can flat, uh, we can make a flat to uh, and use those dissimilarity measures. So now I have two uh, data of different teams and I can describe them using a vector, normalized vector. So this normalized vector allows me to search for areas of the similar multi-team patterns, but also to group similar multi-team uh, patterns. And we applied this idea for the data in Europe. So I uh, collected data from three different sources, land cover data from uh, Copernicus project and European Space Agency, land from data uh, uh, and source data. All of those data sets are available on the global scale. So these results can be, this, this, this example can be easily extended. And next, I reprojected, resampled uh, the data to have the, uh, uh, the consistent 300 meter resolution of all of those uh, layers. And uh, also I simplified the categories. So uh, my, my data that I, that I used had nine land cover categories for landform classes and 12 soil categories. Next, I divided the whole area into so the, 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 the area of Europe into blocks or local landscapes of 15 by 15 kilometers. So uh, uh, as, as a result, I've got about 40,000 local landscapes, so square areas. Uh, and next, I calculated this integrated concurrence matrix for each square area. 
Next, uh, the, the question, the next question was how many categories or how many landscape types uh, there are? And this is, this is a very loaded question. Um, so I started by looking at, uh, at applying method called TSNE, which allows me to, to uh, draw the, uh, the, 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 the space of the spatial signatures uh, into just 2D image that you can see on the left. And uh, first, I just done that without any colors. And it gave me one important insight. And that insight is that uh, land landscape types, uh, they, they do not create very distinct uh, clusters. They uh, rather, they, this is a very continuous space. And therefore, it is uh, probably impossible to just get one uh, value that is that is uh, so-called correct, and probably decision about the number of landscape types should this should depends on the uh, purpose and the, the the output we want to achieve. However, if for this example, I I used uh, I, I created twenty landscape types. You can see different colors here, so each color represent different landscape types, and. Uh, this division was done using the k-means clustering. And you can see the output on the right. So we can see that we have 20 different landscape types. And each of these example landscape types can be uh, looked upon and described using uh, patterns of, of the each layers and the relation between each layers. We also calculated quality of the of the of those uh, landscape types delineation also our our clustering using two metrics metrics first is homogeneity so how consistent uh, internally uh, uh, those landscape uh, types are and the second one is interdistance so how different our landscape is from every other landscape and here the homogeneity smaller the value is uh, the, the better and uh, uh, with interdistance larger the value is the better and and on the right you can see a summary table and i highlighted two uh, landscape types number 19 which was probably the be the best in terms of uh, homogeneity so it was the most homogeneous uh, but also quite uh, different from the other types and uh, on the opposite, number seven, it was also, it was very distinct from the other types, but it was not very homogeneous. And you can look at each of the landscape types one by one. So here we can, I show you one example of the landscape type number 19. So this is a landscape type with the, on the plains. So this is, this is plains with mostly one, uh, two categories of soils and with agriculture with some urban areas in the red and some forest and green forest. And th those are uh, patches of, of all of those categories, but mostly uh, it's mostly uh, agriculture areas. However, we can look at each of the landscape types also in a slightly different way, which is called a pattern mosaic. So what's a pattern mosaic? Pattern mosaic is when we randomly select, uh, uh, in this example, I randomly selected uh, 225 local landscapes and shuffled them to create a uh, unreal representation. And this representation is called pattern mosaic. And you can see here that this is a pattern mosaic uh, for the land type 19 for land cover, landforms, and soils. And basically here you can see how this area would look like if we, if we could have this landscape type for the larger areas. Oh, and three minutes remaining, Jack. Thank you. And here we can basically say that all of those uh, layers, they create patterns, not only when you look at the scale of 15 by 15 kilometers, but also consistent patterns 
for the scale of 20, 20, 225 uh, square kilometers. On the other hand, when we looked at the pattern mosaic of the seventh landscape type, you can see there uh, that this landscape type is not very consistent. It's, it's rather chaotic, which probably suggests that we should uh, create more uh, categories because here we have uh, probably two or maybe three different uh, landscape types that should be divided into some subgroups. And that's why uh, this, this land, the pattern mosaic visualization is useful. And we compare this result with the existing techniques and you can see the cell approach on the left and our approach on the right. And you can uh, hopefully see it already that the pattern-based approach is better when we want to create regions and zones of similar patterns and not this uh, salt and pepper uh, uh, visualization on the left. So this, this approach can uh, delineate not only simple multi-thematic patterns, but also complex multi-thematic patterns. So just to conclude, um, what are the considerations for uh, creating landscape types? And there are a lot of considerations like what type of layers you to use, how to pre-process them, what's the spatial scale that we want to use and which signature to apply and so on and so on. And many of those questions should depend on the purpose of the, of the study. And, uh, uh, and, and I don't have a great answers yet how to uh, decide on most of those on, or how to solve most of those uh, questions. And that's why my, my, in my future work, I plan to not only validate those landscape types and, and think about how to add additional information, uh, but also how to maybe group them in the way that they are more, more uh, consistent uh, in terms of homogeneity. Uh, think about this landscape type number seven, but also I want to think about the ways how to maybe guide uh, the, the, the answers of the questions on the left. So just to sum up, uh, here I wanted to present to you this numerical signature of multi-thematic patterns, which is called INCOMA. And this uh, signature allows us to describe patterns of many categorical variables at the same time. And this way we can create uh, maps of landscape types, but it also allows us to do some things that I haven't shown you, like search for areas with similar multi-thematic patterns or, uh, or find changes in multi-thematic patterns. If you want to learn more, uh, I, uh, there are some contact informations uh, on, the, on the right. So thank you all for being here uh, with me and, and I look forward to your questions. I say, I, I used Cocoa to make this is about, ooh. I had to think four decades ago, no, three decades ago, thank you, thankfully. Um, but it was developed, as you know, in in the field of uh, image processing, really, wasn't it? And for texture analysis of digital pictures. And I remember at the time, uh, there was an issue about um, the which co-occurrence you're actually measuring. So, for example, uh, when I was using it, you did a lag between... Um, adjacent sounds horizontally and vertically and diagonally, and then maybe took an average of those scores. Um, wasn't totally clear which direction you were taking the co-occurrence in, uh, whether it's one direction or several directions, and also whether there's any benefit, again, in the image processing world, there was a benefit of having a single lag, i.e. the adjacent pixel, and then looking also at the second and third and fourth pixel away. And some, sometimes that revealed more information as well. So I wonder if you had any views on, on that sort of discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you for the, for, for the great questions. Um, about the, the adjacency. So in, 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 in our work, we uh, usually take all of the neighbors. So we count uh, neighbors, uh, either four neighbors or eight neighbors, depending on the on the problem on the data. So we don't look at the just uh, one neighbor, uh, we just look at the, all, the, all of the neighbors. And, and based on, on our results, uh, for most work, the, the four neighbors usually work uh, good. And, and when we, 
So in this work, uh, because we use this, those landscape, local landscapes, we, we do not usually care about the second uh, neighbor or, or the third level neighbor because it, they will be counted in some other way in this coherence matrix. That being said, uh, this, um, the whole pattern-based approach I showed you just an example of using uh, co-occurrence matrix or this in comma uh, representation, but the, the whole approach should work even if you use some different uh, representation, different signature. So I think this is also important to, 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 to try different signatures and, and sometimes decide which, which of the signatures is the, uh, the most uh, applicable and, and the, 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 the most useful because we also try to create some signatures based on some uh, order of neighborhoods or, uh, or and so on. But that being said, I also uh, think and that often the simplest solution is the best one. And that's why we think that uh, for the most purposes, the, the in comma uh, or, or, or for one level thematic layers, uh, comma is, is more useful than creating uh, more complex representations. But of course there is like, there is always some uh, pros and cons. And, and sometimes if you, with concurrence matrix, we, of course we do that um, uh, thing that we simplify things. We are, we are compressing information in a lot and we are losing some information in that way. And we, uh, we are aware of that. And, and that's the decision of the people who are creating, for example, landscape types or doing this kind of analysis. How much information are you willing to give up to, uh, to, to create uh, this landscape types and, and so on. And because with, for example, comma or in comma, those signatures are relatively small and that's why they are useful for global or, or continental analysis uh, because those kind of calculations could be done in, in minutes on, a, on, a, on a, uh, modern laptops and they do not, re do not uh, uh, require any uh, computational power, uh, in fact. From Duncan again, who's congratulating you on your presentation. Um, he's asking, have you compared your approach to a manual approach and have you considered adding cultural layers to the sort of decision making? The, 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 this this uh, signature is, or the, the whole idea and implementation of this idea is fairly new. So we haven't done anything like this yet. Um, but I've done similar thing just on the one uh, thematic pattern. So I was comparing manual delineations with uh, land cover patterns. Uh, we, uh, and we've done that in a, in a few papers. We showed the exam examples of that in, in a few papers. And usually those comparisons stand well. Uh, in some, of course, there are some differences, but, but they, are, they are not uh, very different. Uh, but we never, I think, uh, up till now, used any um, cultural layers, mostly because those ideas that we are developing and using they are mostly they are mostly limited to categorical rasters, and I am not aware of of any layers about cultural information on the categorical layer on the global scale or continental scales. So, if there are any, uh, if you have any ideas of how we can do that, I will be very happy if you can email me or or, or give me some advice on how to or or what kind of a data we could add to our our projects or our, our work. There's a question on the Q&A box as well. Um, what is the T-SNE? I, I missed that myself, but can you, can you see that? What is the T-SNE? Yeah. Can you elaborate? So this is, um, uh, so probably most of, 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 of you are familiar with principal components analysis. So when, when we have a PCA, we, um, we project our data into two dimensional space uh, to show uh, some simplification and show principal components. And, and uh, TSNE is, is a, uh, let's, let's say a, to, for a simplification case, uh, it's an it's a alternative approach, uh, which is very useful to look at the data, maybe not as useful to, 
interpret the, the like principal components like in the PCA, but it's a very useful to look at the data and see if our data or the attributes of our data uh, are actually creating different um, groups in the search space or are our uh, information is actually just uh, one um, continuous search space. Uh, and this, this method is, is uh, I think, right now quite often used in a computer science and, 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 and similar. And I think it could be very useful for many uh, GIA science works as well. <laughs>